So good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening's webinar focused on question one on the November 2nd ballot here in Maine. NRCM strongly endorses a yes vote on question one to stop the destructive CMP corridor uh, through Western Maine. And we're thrilled to be joined this evening by Mainers from all across the state and from diverse backgrounds who have been fighting the CMP corridor for many years in many different arenas uh, to share why they're voting yes on question one and why they're so strongly opposed to the corridor. Um, but before we get started with our program this evening, let me introduce myself and NRCM. My name is Todd Martin. I'm the Grassroots Outreach Coordinator at the Natural Resources Council of Maine. NRCM is a nonprofit membership organization protecting, restoring, and conserving Maine's environment now and for future generations. For more than 62 years, NRCM has been protecting the places and the way of life that make Maine such a special place to live, work, and play. NRCM harnesses the power of the law, science, and the voices of more than 25,000 members and supporters who live in Maine, around the country, and all around the world. Uh, we have a staff of 28 in our offices located in Augusta, just steps from the State House. Um, a couple of notes about the Zoom webinar platform that we're using this evening. I'm sure we're all pretty familiar with uh, Zoom webinars uh, a couple of years into this pandemic. Um, First thing is this webinar is being recorded. Uh, you'll receive a follow-up email from me in the next couple of days with a link to watch the recording on YouTube. And we hope that you'll, you'll share that recording of this program with your friends and family and encourage them to uh, head to the polls and vote yes on one on November 2nd. Um, and your video and your audio is disabled this evening by design. You'll only be able to see and hear our presenters this evening. But if you have a question during the program for one of our speakers, please type that question in the Q&A box, which you can find on the lower ribbon of your Zoom webinar screen. We'll have plenty of time for questions uh, after our panel presentation. Um, so tonight we're joined by an all-star lineup of folks who have been fighting the CMP corridor for many years, uh, who are here to tell you why they're voting yes on question one to stop the corridor. Um, we had a few last minute changes to our lineup, uh, but we've substituted all stars for more all stars. Uh, so we're really, we really appreciate everyone for being here. Um, tonight we're joined by Liz Caruso, who's a member of the select board in the town of Caratunk in Northern Somerset County, uh, which the corridor would be built through. Welcome Liz, thanks for being here. We're also joined by Jeff Reardon, who's the main Brook Trout project director for Trout Unlimited. Jeff knows every stream, pond, lake, tributary, and fishing hole uh, in Western Maine uh, where the corridor would be built through. Uh, welcome, Jeff. Thanks for being here. Uh, we're also joined this evening by Audrey Huffnagel, who's a, a youth activist with Maine Youth for Climate Justice, um, who's been outspoken on the impacts that CMP's corridor would have on Maine's woods and waters. Welcome, Audrey. Uh, we're also pleased to have Dan Cosnares, the Water Resources Manager for the Penobscot Indian Nation which strongly opposes the CMP corridor. Welcome, Dan. Uh, and we're also joined by State Representative Nicole Grahowski. Uh, Nicole has been an outspoken critic of the CMP corridor in the state legislature and the leader in holding CMP accountable to the people of Maine. Uh, welcome, Nicole. So before we hear from that uh, great lineup uh, of panelists, I'm gonna turn it over to NRCM staff scientist, Nick Bennett, to share why NRCM strongly opposes the CMP corridor and why we urge Mainers to vote yes on question one on the November 2nd ballot to ban the CMP corridor. So take it away, Nick. Thanks so much, Todd. And thanks to all the rest of the panelists for joining us tonight. And thanks uh, to all of you who are listening to and watching this webinar. Um, when NRCM first got involved in looking at the CMP corridor issue, which I think is four years ago now, we were not um, right off the bat opposed to it. Um, we did a bunch of research and that's what led us to our position. And the place where we started was, was this very large project going through um, important habitat in Western Maine going to bring any real climate benefits or not? And we uh, gathered information from the places that we could we started with looking at what was happening in New Hampshire because uh, 
New Hampshire was the first choice um, for Massachusetts in terms of bringing uh, a power line from Hydro-Quebec down to Massachusetts. New Hampshire wisely rejected that proposal from Massachusetts. One of the key reasons that they rejected that proposal is because their uh, public advocate or the equivalent of the public advocate called the Council for the Public, um, whose job it is to represent the interests of New Hampshire ratepayers, concluded that unless there is new generation that Hydro-Quebec is building, there would be no climate benefits to this project. It would simply be a shell game of moving Hydro-Quebec electricity sales from existing customers in places like the Midwest or New Brunswick and rerouting those electrons to Massachusetts, which was willing to pay more for them. That would leave the places like New Brunswick and Massachusetts with having to make up for that lost power. Uh, sorry, the places like the Midwest and New Brunswick with having to make up for that lost power. Um, both the Midwest and New Brunswick get a significant amount of power from coal. So if they were backfilling power um, that they used to get from Hydro-Quebec with coal, so Massachusetts could use it, that would not be a good thing, even if it decreased um, natural gas related emissions in Massachusetts. So that was our first clue that there was a real problem here. Our second clue was we looked at the testimony of the Massachusetts Attorney General in their regulatory proceedings about this project in Massachusetts. The Attorney General's witness was very clear that there was no way to verify whether or not uh, Hydro-Quebec was actually giving Massachusetts any climate benefits. And in fact, they said the most likely outcome of the proposal was that Hydro-Quebec would simply shift electricity sales from existing customers to Massachusetts. And that would in involve no net benefit to the climate, no overall reduction in climate emissions. So we were struck by this. We could not see how the damage um, that this project will cause to the Western mountain region of Maine could possibly be worth it given such strong information that there would be no climate benefits to this project. And so that led us to be very supportive of a bill in the Maine legislature uh, to require an objective study that looked at CMPs uh, and Hydro-Quebec's project and the impact it would have on greenhouse gas emissions over the whole of Hydro-Quebec's jurisdiction from the Midwest to New England, to New Brunswick. And uh, rather than just looking at New England in isolation, which is what the studies for uh, the Maine PUC and Massachusetts looked at, we did succeed in getting that uh, study proposal passed in the legislature, but not by enough to have it pass as an emergency. And so the bill died. The reason it died is because Hydro-Quebec and CMP hired an army of lobbyists to turn just enough legislators against it to prevent us from getting the two thirds majority we needed to have the bill pass as an emergency. And so we were left to conclude, why is CMP hiring an army of lobbyists to stop an objective study of greenhouse gas benefits or lack thereof associated with this project if, those, if they were so confident that those benefits were real? And we were left with the inescapable conclusion that those benefits are not real, that this project is a shell game and will not help the climate. And that is why NRCM has come to the position that we are in, which is supporting a yes vote on question one. And the rest of these great panelists will tell you about in more detail about the impacts um, that this huge uh, for-profit, entirely profit-driven project will have on the great forests and waters of Maine. Hi everyone, thank you so much, Nick. Really appreciate it and so grateful for all that NRCM has done all these years to make Mainers aware of the project impacts. 
So my name is Liz Caruso. Um, I'm the first selectman of the town of Caratunk, and for the last 30 years, I've worked as a registered Maine guide in the Forks area. So why do folks in our area, uh, that our neck of the woods, oppose the corridor? Well, contrary to CMP's description of the upper Kennebec region as a working forest, our area is rich in spectacular natural resources. Our lakes, ponds, brooks, streams, mountains, wetlands, and of course, um, the great forest um, that has such a global significance in our area that they're putting this project through. But all of our natural resources attract landowners and visitors, making our area a year-round wilderness recreational hub for Western Maine. Um, we have world-class whitewater rivers in the Kennebec and Dead Rivers, um, brook trout and salmon fisheries are renowned, numerous hiking trails, including the Appalachian Trail, and some of the best, uh, most scenic groomed snowmobile trails in the state. We're also home to the National Scenic Byway, Route 201. And essentially, all of segment one and two from the border up to Bingham, which is about 70 miles, is highly sensitive ecologically, environmentally, and visually. So landowners, business owners, visitors, recreationists, we all find it just infuriating that CMP and Hydro-Quebec are so determined to bring this Massachusetts power corridor through this highly sensitive area, damaging our tourism, our scenic views, and the ways of life of so many Mainers. Um, not to mention the very natural resources that make Maine so special. So after CMP came to the host communities, um, you know, they were making empty promises and hiding impacts. 86% of our host communities voted and 100% opposed the corridor. Uh, 25 towns in the state have voted to oppose the corridor. So it became abundantly clear that CMP just can't be trusted. They only care about bringing profits home to Spain. Um, if they cared about benefiting Maine, they would have properly planned for the corridor, um, but they didn't. In our area, it was very infuriating that they never considered or studied impacts to our snowmobiling industry, fishing, recreation, the economy, the absence of fire and emergency resources, but really um, they never considered bearing the line, which is the industry standard for direct current lines, um, and it would reduce the risk of fires, of ice damage, and prolonged outages, which um, you know a lot of Mainers are um, unfortunately getting used to. Uh, but we do know that Avangrid buries these DC lines in other states. Um, they just did not want the expense here in Maine. So, you know, for these reasons, you know, Mainers care deeply about the state and they have been fighting tirelessly for the way life should be. For the last two years, hundreds of Mainers from across the state, not just those in our host communities, but all over the state, they have sacrificed extensively their time and heartfelt efforts to collect and notarize over 140,000 signatures during the coldest winter with freezing pens and battling all the adversities of a pandemic. They wanted to give Mainers the opportunity to have their voices be heard and to make a difference. For many of us, it was the second time we collected signatures. Uh, many Mainers since then have been working in state fairs, have been sending letters to the editor, sharing on social media, placing signs, basically doing whatever they could to make sure that we were able to combat CMP and Hydro-Quebec's lies um, and give Mainers a chance to vote yes to ban the corridor. Hundreds and thousands of Mainers have testified before the legislature and agencies and the Army Corps. Um, you know, Mainers just oppose this green energy scam that Nick was just talking about. They don't want it scarring our state and they don't want the company who can't even keep our power on to make Massachusetts, the Massachusetts power line, the top priority over the main ratepayers distribution line. So because uh, Maine regulators disregarded all this opposition from the public and followed executive branch coercion and lobbying efforts, um, we have had to combat it different ways um, to spread lies about clean energy and about jobs for Mainers. Um, and they're not jobs for Mainers. Living in a host community, we can tell you truthfully that the overwhelming majority of construction workers are from out of state. Regardless of what CMP says, they hired a Wisconsin logging company to clear instead of helping out our main forestry industry. 
Um, now, the main forestry industry will take a big cut if this project goes through because experts say it will cut the biomass industry by two thirds. Um, and of course, that has a rippling effect into the entire forestry industry all the way into, wood, into the woods. They also hired nationwide construction companies, which hire workers from all over the country. So we've been seeing their out of state license plates and their accents are clear. You know, just because a worker rents a hotel room for months on end doesn't make them a main resident or a main citizen. Um, but CMP will continue to say Say that you know 80% of the workers are from Maine. We can tell you living in the host communities, that is not true. So we just really ask that you would please get out and cast your vote so that the huge efforts of our Mainers over these last few years will ring out loud and clear. That foreign corporations and their armies of lobbyists influencing our elected representatives and unelected bureaucrats will not dictate what goes on in our state. The citizens of Maine have shown themselves to be a force to be reckoned with. We won't be silenced and we won't be ignored. We can determine what goes on in our state, but only if we all get out and vote and cast a yes vote on November 2nd. So please don't waste this amazing effort and the sacrifices of our grassroots citizens made to give all Mainers the opportunity to be heard. The regulatory and legislative process may have failed to heal the will of the people that they represent, but this is our chance. So please vote yes on November 2nd on question one. Thank you so much. Thank you um, so much, NR Sam, for having all of us, and also uh, especially to Nick and Liz for those great intros. It's um, I do have more things to add, but you covered so much of the reasons why I will be voting yes on one on November 2nd. So thank you for laying that great overview. So to introduce myself, I am Nicole Verhowski, and I am the state representative serving House District 132, which is the city of Ellsworth and the town of Trenton. And I am in my second term in the legislature. And in both terms, I have been a member of the Energy Utilities and Technology Committee. So this subject matter has been in front of my committee multiple times, and I took a great interest in it. And really, like so many of my colleagues, dug deep into the details about what does, a, what does a corridor like this mean for Maine? What does it mean for our economy? What does it mean for our environment? Um, also relevant in my background is that I have a degree in environmental studies and chemistry, and I make maps for a living. So the question of where to put uh, transmission lines is one that I think we need to deliberate carefully um, with the best data available about what uh, impacts there will be on the environment. So, I think it's been well said already here, but there will be significant damage to Maine's environment. Uh, the corridor is cutting 53 new miles of permanent transmission line corridor through undeveloped forests, which Liz uh, pointed out are so important for uh, the natural resources there and the recreational benefits as well. Um, the upper Kennebec region is a truly unique place despite uh, what has been said. And it's special to me because I have paddled across the state of Maine in my canoe, and I now maintain a section of, of a, a trail, a canoe trail that that corridor is actually cutting right across. So I know this area very intimately. It is a very, very special part of our state, as special as Baxter State Park, as special as the National Monument, as special as Acadia, which is right here in my backyard. And so that's part of the reason that I really wanna defend, uh, defend the yes effort and support the local people who by themselves could not bring this question to the ballot. It took people all remain caring about this region and about each other to bring this to the ballot. And I'm proud that myself and my parents, for instance, were some of those many, many people out on those cold days uh, collecting those signatures at, at uh, farmer's markets and, and on street corners uh, to bring this to the main people to decide. So as was said, I hope you will take the opportunity to help cast your vote. But another reason that I am supporting this uh, yes on one vote is that um, CMP just cannot be trusted. They have been lobbying for years, uh, much longer than I've been in the legislature against renewable energy legislation. They are not climate leaders today and they have not been climate leaders in the past. This is not about saving the planet. This is about profit for foreign governments and foreign corporations. So I know that we'd like to think that there's one project out there that can save us from the climate crisis, but there isn't. 
and this is not it. Interestingly, here in the state of Maine, we are not even legally allowed to use energy generated by a project like Hydro Quebec's reservoirs to meet our own clean energy requirements. That is because this is not clean energy. Methane emissions have climate warming effects similar to natural gas fired electricity generators from reservoirs like these. The destruction of the boreal forest, the wetland and the peatland ecosystems uh, causes a significant limitation for all the carbon that are stored in places like that. And then there's also the disruption of all the spring runoff when you have reservoirs of that magnitude, much, much bigger than anything we see here in Maine. And that affects nutrient concentrations, water temperatures, and makes it impossible for many creatures to live downstream of these dams. So it is not clean energy. And legally in Maine, we do not consider it to be clean energy. So if we were to buy this power, it would not help us meet our own very ambitious climate goals. And as was mentioned, uh, we don't even know if this is going to be a shell game or not. So if it were clean energy, uh, we might care to know how it was accounted for, but I just dismiss uh, that argument altogether. So it is, uh, it is a shell game of dirty energy, essentially, um, that we should not accept for the for the minimal uh, benefits that are being promised to mean people and for the significant, significant destruction that is happening in our state. Um, one other thing that I think is really interesting is that Massachusetts has a goal, an actual requirement in law to achieve a certain amount of renewable energy, but they don't have to accept this project as the source. They received 46 bits for all different projects to fulfill that requirement. And this just happens to be the cheapest one that's still available to them. So I would encourage Massachusetts to go back and look at the other bids and perhaps find something that's a little bit more in their backyard and do like we're doing in Maine and be leaders in generation of clean energy. In fact, some of the projects that were proposed are actual clean energy projects that would be built in Maine and would create uh, jobs at the point of construction, but also maintenance because it is uh, a little more onerous to maintain some of the types of facilities that were um, that were uh, proposed. So, you know, I would say to Massachusetts, I don't know what you guys are doing. It's not clean energy, and you ought to generate your actual clean energy yourselves in your state, and let us generate clean energy here in Maine. And as Liz pointed out, we do worry about the economic benefit um, that will be precluded if this dirty energy floods our grid in Maine and the entirety of the New England grid. We have a burgeoning clean energy economy here in the state, and I would like to see us be able to achieve the maximum benefit from that as opposed to being undercut by um, this dirty energy from Quebec that can flood our grid. So I really hope that Maine people will reject this dirty energy corridor. Uh, it's been nicely branded as the Clean Energy Connect, and you know, the shinier that the mailers are and the more ads there are um, and the more uh, gimmicky phrases, the less you should probably trust these foreign governments and foreign corporations and instead trust your fellow Mainers who care about these places, love these places and have worked so hard to protect them. So thank you so much for the opportunity to speak tonight. And I look forward to the question section as well. Great, thank you, Todd, and and um, thank you to Liz and Nicole as well. Um, I see we already got questions rolling in, so I'm going to try to be brief. Um, I think you got great overviews. They, Nick, I think covered the energy issue really well. I think you got great overviews from both the regional level um, and the statewide level um, from respectively Liz and Nicole. And so, what I want to dial in on and, and talk about is what I've worked on for the last 25 years which is brook trout in Maine. Uh, next slide, Todd. Um, so that's a brook trout in Mountain Brook uh, that, that I caught, I don't know, four or five years ago, somewhere in my, somewhere in my photo archive. Uh, Mountain Brook is one of the, I believe it's 250 brook trout streams that the uh, NECEC corridor will cross. Um, of those, we at Trout Unlimited are most concerned about and are opposing the project because of um, the, the crossings in segment one, which runs from the Canadian border in Beatty Township across to uh, Moxie Pond before segment two heads south down to Bingham. 
Not that there are not impacts in the other sections, but that 53 miles of segment one that cuts across what is the most intact forest east of the Rocky Mountains um, in, 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 uh, in, in the US is really critical. This area is uh, a stronghold that has been important to me in both my professional life um, and my personal life. Uh, it's actually difficult for me to talk about this project without getting a little bit emotional because this is um, such a special part of Maine, uh, particularly for those of us who like to hunt and fish. Next slide. Um, this is who I am. I'm not going to read that out loud, um, but I literally um, I got pneumonia because I was so excited about fly, about fishing for trout on my parents' first vacation as a married couple together. Um, and I've done it several times since uh, in my adult life. Uh, it's, it's, it's what I do. It's who I am. It's what I've done for work for 25 years. Um, and Maine is absolutely the best place to do it if, if what you care about is brook trout. Next, next please. Um, the map that you're seeing on the left here in colors of uh, red and green, I'm not gonna go into the details of this, but green is good. Those are brook trout populations. Uh, when, if we assess everything from Maine to Georgia and color everything in shades of green that is ranked as intact, um, most of Maine shows up as intact. Um, very little of any place else, even other Northern rural states like New Hampshire, Vermont, upstate New York, Maine is both quantitative qualitatively different. Those areas that are shown in red and pink and gray, we don't see much gray in, in New England, um, are areas that used to have brook trout but don't anymore, and we have virtually none of that in Maine. The NECEC route, you can see that in the map on the right, um, cuts across the heart of what's the best of the best part of the Western Maine Mountains. And Liz talked about that region in general, uh, but if you're a brook trout fan, that's a part of the state. If, if you didn't grow up fishing it, you grew up dreaming about fishing it. Next, please. Uh, one of the major projects I worked on in my career was a project called the Coldstream Forest. This was a state purchase of 8,200 acres uh, with the goal of protecting intact from its source to its mouth, Coldstream, which is one of the most important tributaries to the Kennebec River. And in fact, it's not a tributary to, but brook trout swim all the way from the Dead River, uh, several miles up the Kennebec to go into Coldstream to spawn. And they'll be doing that right about now. Uh, it's, it's, it's essential to the, both if you're, a, if you're a fishing guide in the region, a lot of the wild trout you might, you, your clients are catching in the Kennebec and the dead are being spawned in Coldstream. Um, if you're a brook trout in the region, you're going into Coldstream midsummer because it's cold. That's why it's named that. Uh, and you're going into Coldstream in the fall to spawn because it's one of the very few streams that goes into the Kennebec Gorge that actually doesn't have a waterfall at its mouth. Next, please. Uh, this is just a map of the Coldstream Forest Project, that big wide amoeba. Uh, the idea of that is it protects a set of ponds and the headwaters, and then the 15 mile length of Coldstream all the way down to its confluence with the Kennebec. Cutting across that in red, and, and that is not an exact map, that's me trying to draw with my mouse and I flunked every art class I ever took, but that's the approximate route of the NECEC as it comes down, crosses Route 201, which is also shown in orange here, then crosses Coldstream, heads east across some state-owned lands and then south along the border of the Coldstream project that the state just spent $8 million buying to protect brook trout. Uh, that, that project was closed in 2016. Next. Um, this is the crossing of Coldstream uh, and, and uh, I'm still kicking myself about this when the project was negotiated um, as the state and the landowner were working on um, where the boundaries were going to be it was decided that a relatively narrow section along this, the, the east-west thing that you see running along there um, that's not colored is uh, the Capitol Road, the major log hauling road. The state didn't really wanna own the Capitol Road and the landowner didn't really wanna be having a short section of their road owned by the state. So they uh, essentially carved out the footprint of the road that would stay uh, with the existing landowner. And um, little did we know that as that negotiation was happening, um, CMP was getting their lease across two public lots to the east of this um, with plans to go through that gap that had just been created. And, and I will never stop. I, I will never stop kicking myself for not catching that that was going on, although I don't know how we would have known about it. Next slide. Uh, just a couple of photos. These are from Coldstream, but they could be from any of the other brook trout streams in the region that this thing is going to cross. 
I'll just name a couple of those, Enchanted Stream, Salmon Stream, uh, the South Branch of the Moose River, Gold Brook, uh, Mountain Brook, Tom Hegan Stream. All of those have similar brook trout values to Cold Stream. All of them are actually targets for me in, in terms of trying to prioritize other land conservation efforts in this region. Um, and frankly, their value for that kind of conservation is going to be significantly lowered by this uh, stream coming across them, reducing the shade, having impacts of sediment, providing increased access, uh, and all of the other things that go along with clearing and maintaining a corridor. And my biggest fear is that the corridor for the power line becomes uh, a route that other things follow. So the corridor has gone through. We'll see another power line come in next to it. CMP actually owns the rights to build another one right next to it. Um, we'll see a highway come on next to that. We'll see a pipeline go in on the other side. And all of a sudden, there's this big fragmenting corridor cutting through the middle of the, of the nicest piece of forest east of the Mississippi. Next. Uh, headwater ponds. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about more about this in a later slide. So just keep going. That's a nice picture. That guy can really cast, can't he? That was me. Um, this is Cold Stream Falls. This is about a mile and a half upstream of where the NECEC will cross Cold Stream to give you an idea of both what the intact forest on Cold Stream looks like today and also of what the habitat looks like, which looks, there's not a waterfall, but other than that, the habitat at the, at the crossing looks very much like this. Next slide. Uh, and this has been a destination for fishermen. This is a 20, uh, sorry, 1930s era brochure for Parlin Lake Lodge, which was one of the sporting camps. And there's many of them that uh, operated in this area. Parlin Lake Lodge is still in business, still fishing these same waters. And um, um, again, the, the, the corridor goes about six miles south of Lang Pond, which is one of my favorite trout ponds. Next. The corridor goes right next to Rock Pond, and Rock Pond is uh, is not on the Cold Stream property. It's west on the on the uh, Enchant on the uh, Spencer Road, about 15 miles. Um, Rock Pond may be the best brook trout pond in this region. It's fed by an enormous set of springs, many of which feed a little tiny brook that comes into the northwest side of it. If you look on my map there, you'll see a little uh, Google Earth pin that's labeled Spawning Inlet. Uh, the population of brook trout in Rock Pond is entirely maintained by spawning in that tiny little inlet. And uh, the NECEC crosses it and has already been cleared crossing that inlet 500 feet upstream of where it discharges into the pond. I think there are serious questions about whether that pond and its inlet stream will continue to be as productive as they are because of, uh, of the crossing going across there. And then also crossing three other tiny little unmapped spring fed tributaries that probably also see uh, a fair number of spawning trout. Again, the trout ought to be spawning right about now. It's mid-October. Next slide. Uh, and I just want to talk quickly about NECEC and the public lands. You've probably heard about this. A, a number of us, uh, including me and Liz as witnesses, um, were in the DEP hearing uh, about the, the suspending the permit because frankly, the, the, a judge has ruled that the lease that was issued across public lands was issued illegally uh, with no public process, with no public input, should have had a review by the legislature and did not, uh, certainly would not have gotten approval by the legislature had they brought it there given the level of opposition that I know among legislators I, I, I'm speaking with on a regular basis. Um, so because it can't go across there, CMP is talking about two additional routes and, and their, uh, their, their route here is kind of outlined in orange and the two alternatives, this is their own map, uh, are shown in blue, uh, which would go uh, east across the Moosehead Conservation Easement. And then they have a route left uh, to the west on the west side of Route 201 in red that would go across some other conservation lands along the Dead and Kennebec River right in the forks. Um, and what is amazing to me is that in the face of letters from landowners of lands they are going to cross who have told them, we have conservation easements that do not allow what you are proposing. And by the way, you never came and talked to us and asked about this. Uh, CMP two days ago was testifying that they were going to build these lines anyway. I don't know if they're intending to do that via eminent domain. I don't know if they have some legal strategy to undo the conservation easements on these lands. Maybe they just didn't do their homework and now they're blustering, but it's the way they have done business on this project since the beginning and it just infuriates me. Uh, next slide, which I think is the last. Um, and just uh, to note this segment one that I'm, I'm, I'm most concerned about, a huge part of it, all the areas in red on segment one have not yet been cut. 
um, so that if this project can be suspended quickly, and I believe a yes vote in a couple of weeks will help make that happen, um, it's not too late to save the clearing on parts of segment one. The parts that have been cut will grow back. They haven't put up a poll on this segment yet. And uh, I think we, we still have a chance to, um, we, we may have a chance to block the entire project, but I certainly think we have an excellent chance to put the pressure on them and get segment one, which is, is the most damaging part not to happen. And that's it, Todd. Last slide just encourages people to vote no. Um, Trout Unlimited is happy to work with NRCM and the Appalachian Mountain Club as one of the interveners on this project for several years, along with Liz, who's working with one of the other intervener groups and, and all the other panelists. This is, a, this is a bad project. It shouldn't happen. Please vote no. I think you mean vote yes, Jeff. Sorry. Yes, I do. Please vote yes. <laughs> corridor. Awesome. Thanks, Jeff. And we'll turn it over to Audrey. Good evening, everyone. Thank you to NRCM for letting me and all these other amazing panelists speak here tonight about why we oppose the CMP corridor and support voting yes on question one. My name is Audrey Huffnagel, and I'm a sophomore in high school in Denver, Scott, Maine. I work with Maine Youth for Climate Justice, a statewide coalition of over 300 youth fighting for bold climate, climate action. And I have been working against the CMP corridor for about a year. I got involved in the opposition after hearing a presentation from a fellow activist about the impacts of the corridor on the state of Maine and the effects of Megadam hydropower on the environment and on indigenous communities in Quebec, which is where most of the power for this project would come from. I love to hike and cross country ski in the Maine woods. In fact, just this summer, I hiked the 100 mile wilderness along the Appalachian Trail, not far from the corridor's path. I don't want the corridor to destroy this beautiful land and the habitats that it provides for wildlife. What really made me passionate about opposing this project was when I went to a webinar where I heard from indigenous people whose lands and homes had been destroyed by hydroelectric dams, like the ones supplying the power for this project. The destruction that Hydro-Quebec is causing perpetrates practices of colonialism and environmental racism. The hydroelectric dams aren't even clean energy, though CMP and Hydro-Quebec have tried to paint them as such. The flooding caused by the dams is destructive to the environment, and the creation of the dams produces methane, a greenhouse gas which contributes to the climate crisis. This project is clearly not a solution to climate change. And for all these reasons, the CMP corridor goes against all the principles of climate justice that I believe in. The completion of the corridor would give Hydro-Quebec a larger market for hydropower, which would make them want to expand and build more dams. Failing to reject the corridor would reward Hydro-Quebec for their past destructive practices and encourage them to continue these practices in the future. The climate justice concerns are also what has motivated many other youth in the state to oppose the corridor. Within Maine Youth for Climate Justice, there is a group of youth who work on the opposition to this corridor. We write letters to the editor, submit testimony for relevant legislation or hearings, and organize educational events. But some, but some young people, like me, who care so much about this issue are too young to be able to vote. Though I cannot vote on question one, most of you can. Voting is a powerful tool, and by doing it, you can make a difference on this issue. If you encourage your friends, family, and neighbors to also vote yes on question one, you'll make an even greater impact. Thank you so much for your interest in this important issue. And please vote yes on question one on November 2nd. Thank you. Great, thanks Audrey and uh, Dan, uh, you're up. Okay, well, thank you very much for the invitation to, to speak on this webinar. I'm Dan Kuzniers, I'm the Water Resources Program Manager for the Penobscot Indian Nation. And uh, I'm gonna first, I'm gonna kind of wear two hats here. I'm gonna start by, <clears throat> excuse me, how this I feel personally affects me. So ever since I was a little kid, um, I think I was six, five or six years old, I came up with my grandfather, my father, my uncles, and we came up to uh, Caratonk. Uh, my aunt used to own a, a little hotel and kind of restaurant um, there in, in Caratonk and 201 kind of bypassed it. But we used to go up there and camp out right behind um, that area, you know, right behind that area along the Kennebec where the Appalachian Trail crosses. 
And, uh, you know, that's a, that's a place. You know, so that started when I was like six years old. And every year since then, I've come to that region whether it be right in that very vicinity or elsewhere on the upper Kennebec, um, up to Indian Pond, Moxie, all those waters that, that um, Jeff was talking about. And now that I take my kids up there, you know, they're, they're teenagers now. And that, that, that area just, we use, we use it for fishing, for hunting, for snowmobiling, hiking, lots of different um, uses. And it's just, it's a place that just should not be disturbed. It should be enjoyed. And uh, so, so that's my personal uh, issue and, and perspective on why I want to see this uh, corridor stopped. Uh, but now I'm going to put on my other hat as a representative of the Penobscot Indian Nation. So the Penobscot Nation is an Indian tribe located here in Maine. And it has thousands of years of deep connection to the lands, waters, forests of Maine, and the fish, wildlife, and all the flora and fauna that depend upon these habitats. The nation believes that it's its responsibility to be good stewards of all that the creator has provided for future generations. We've done much to restore water quality and sea run fish to the Penobscot watershed. How can the tribe stand by and watch this proposed CMP corridor destroy Maine's resources for no Maine benefit. We believe that this project must have an environmental impact statement. Penobscot Nation Chief Kirk Francis has requested in writing to the US Army, US Army Corps of Engineers um, for government to government consultation and for e an EIS. Both have been denied. It's hard for us to understand why the government prepared an EIS for similar projects in Vermont and New Hampshire and would not do so here in Maine. Huge efforts have been made over the past years to restore fisheries and improve water quality in the Kennebec watershed. A project of this size has the potential um, to destroy the watershed and that must be carefully examined. The corridor would cut a 54 foot wide by 53 mile corridor through unfragmented forest in northwestern Maine from Quebec to Moxie Gore with apparently no consideration of burying the line as it's doing throughout much of Vermont. We are concerned, very concerned of the effect of this clear cut by fragmenting wildlife habitat and high value deer wintering yards. We're also concerned with the effect of this project on wild brook trout, including high elevation headwater streams, which are some of the most productive habitats for wild brook trout. The Penobscot Nation is deeply concerned about the effect of the Hydro-Quebec dams on our First Nation and new neighbors to the north in Labrador and Quebec, Canada. The electricity being supplied by Hydro-Quebec will be generated by 33 hydroelectric plants that are unconstitutionally located <clears throat> on the ancestral territory of the First Nations in Quebec and Labrador. In addition, a large portion of it will be generated by Churchill Falls Hydroelectric Station in Labrador, which caused devastating flood, flooding of thousands of square kilometers of Innu Nation territory, for which the Innu Nation has never been compensated by Hydro-Quebec. Mercury contaminates fish that First Nations rely upon for subsistence as the result of the operation of these dams. An EIS must include study of the impacts on these First Nations. Chief Francis and Chiefs of Canada First, First Nations have written letters to President Biden to conduct an, an EIS and take ethical concerns into serious consideration before proceeding with the project. First Nation chiefs letters state that Hydro Capac claims to offer green energy to American consumers while making billions of dollars of profits at the expense, at the expense of indigenous peoples whose ancestral lands it exploits. For these reasons, we urge you to vote yes on question one to stop the CMP corridor from proceeding. Thank you. Great. Well, thanks uh, so much to all of our panelists this evening uh, for your hard work over the years to stop this destructive project.
uh, and for all you've done to get this question uh, on the ballot for Mainers to ha finally have a, have a voice. Um, we've got about 20 minutes for questions. Um, uh, if folks have any questions for any of our panelists, please type those questions in the, the Q&A box on the lower ribbon of your Zoom screen. Let me pull up these questions here. And I'm gonna pitch this first question over to you, Liz. Um, this question comes from Darcy Whitmore. And the question is how many host communities are there and how many of them are opposed to the CMP corridor? Can you talk a little bit about um, the towns uh, along the corridor and how many have uh, voted uh, to oppose the project? Yeah, um, I can't remember right now, but I think it was last year or so I did the math and I, I calculated it was 86% of the towns along the corridor had votes. Um, the towns that are not um, incorporated, so the plantations, they're, um, they're uh, kind of organized by the county, so they're, they're not organized as a town. They didn't hold their own votes. They can't do that. But the, there were 86% of the towns did vote, and 100% of those towns that voted, voted to oppose. 25 towns along the corridor voted to oppose or rescind their support. Well, that's 25, I think that's 25 towns overall in the state. Some of those were down south. Um, okay, right, um, you're correct. Yeah. Great, uh, I'm gonna pitch this next question over to you, Nick. Now this question comes from Lonnie Graham. The question is, I gather from the shell game argument that Hydro-Quebec does not have excess energy they can sell to Massachusetts and is instead going to simply move energy to a more lucrative market. Um, you talked a bit about that in your, your opening remarks. Can you just elaborate on, on that? Yeah, I think the, the fact of the matter is that if they had excess energy, um, they would sell it. They have one of the largest generation and distribution systems in the world. So anytime they get more energy that they can generate, they sell it. They undersell, um, uh, the, the fossil fuel generators in the Midwest and Nova Scotia. So they're not going to sit on energy and just let it go to waste. They're going to sell it. And the idea that somehow they've been saving all this energy to send to Massachusetts when instead they could be making money off of selling it is really absurd. Um, there just isn't, that's just not the way energy systems work. And so, um, I do not think they have excess energy to sell to Massachusetts. Some years they may have more energy than other years because some years it rains more. On the other hand, some years they have less energy than other years. And so they have less energy to sell. Um, so there's just, there's not, um, there's not any evidence of this excess energy that they claim to have. And Liz, would you like to add to that? Sure. I think um, sometimes people are confused. You know, even the um, Attorney General of Massachusetts said that there's no indication that they have extra at new hydropower to send, which is why it doesn't meet, you know, their clean energy needs. And that um, they would do the resource shuffling, the shell game of, you know, sending the premium, the premium six cents per kilowatt hour down to Massachusetts and to supply all their other customers with fossil energy. So there's, um, and the fact that Hydro-Quebec never testified under oath to say that they had the extra power is a clear indication that they don't. And um, yeah, so I know there was more, but that's just something. And Jeff, did you wanna pitch in on that too? Yeah, I, I, I just add that I, I think you have to be pretty foolish to think that Hydro-Quebec won't sell the hydropower that they've already built if this power line can't be built to one specific customer, because that's what the climate cares about, right? Does this power get sold somewhere on the face of the planet Earth? And if they can't sell it to Massachusetts through Maine, they'll find another way to get it to Massachusetts. There are other ways to get it there, some of which are already fully permitted or they'll sell it to somebody more local, like in New Brunswick or Quebec or Nova Scotia, all of which would probably be better alternatives than sending it to Massachusetts. Uh, Quebec would not be because it's almost all supplied by Hydro-Quebec, Hydro but either New Brunswick or Nova Scotia have dirtier power than Massachusetts does and it would have better climate impacts. Or they'll sell it to New York or they'll sell it to Chicago. There's lots of people in the US that want energy and Massachusetts is required if they don't buy Hydro-Quebec to buy some other clean energy source. 
So it's a, I mean, it's a shell game on multiple levels that this is going to be critical to our climate. Hydro-Quebec is going to sell their hydropower and Massachusetts is going to buy clean power. And both of those things are going to happen whether this line gets built or not. Yeah, and just to be completely clear about this, the reason Hydro-Quebec wants to do this is because they don't have these kinds of contracts with their other customers. They sell on the spot market to their other customers. That makes them a lot less money. Massachusetts, for its own greenwashing purposes, is willing to pay a premium um, and pay Hydro-Quebec more so that it can its utilities can make money and it can look like it's meeting it, its greenhouse gas goals, even though it won't be. Great, thanks. Thanks for everybody for your answer there. I'm gonna pitch this next question over to Nicole. This question comes from Ben Conniff. The question is, honestly, one of my biggest hesitations to being anti-corridor is that the fossil fuel industry has spent so much money fighting it. If the corridor is a shell game and it isn't reducing dependence on fossil fuels, then why are fossil fuel companies spending so much to fight it? Thanks, thanks for the question. And I think um, it is true that this project has, or, or this opposition has made uh, interesting allies amongst <laughs> different groups that might not normally be allied. But the truth of the matter is Hydro-Quebec, which is owned by the province of Quebec, the government of Quebec, is outspent uh, the fossil fuel interests by a significant portion. I wish I knew the, the accurate numbers to date. And if somebody five else to does, one. Five to one. <laughs> CMP is spending as well. So yes, there are expenditures by the fossil fuels generators as we're calling them, um, but others have spent more. What I thought was interesting is, as I mentioned, there were those 46 proposals to provide uh, clean energy to Massachusetts. One of those proposals was from Calpine. Calpine is one of the companies that is spending this money. Calpine wanted to build wind projects in Maine, in an area that is not a mountaintop area, um, a flat, much flatter area, in order to provide clean energy to Massachusetts. They're also a huge geothermal company. So it's convenient for CMP to say, these are the dirty fossil guys, but any energy uh, generator worth their salt these days is diversifying. So- uh, I would say, that, oh, sorry, go ahead, Nicole. No, that's all I have to say, thank you. I would just jump in and say that uh, CMP's parent company, Avangrid, owns a half dozen natural gas supply networks. They supply natural gas network, they supply natural gas in New York and throughout New England, thousands of miles of pipelines. So the idea that CMP is not a fossil company is absurd, A. B, um, you know, this is, this is a local, this is an issue of local businesses. So yes, in New England or in Maine, uh, natural gas use might go down and that, does account for some of the, the local natural gas companies fighting this. However, the overall use of fossil fuels throughout the Hydro-Quebec jurisdiction and more importantly, globally, will not decrease as a result of this project because when the electrons are shifted from the Midwest or New Brunswick to supply Massachusetts, so it can lower its uh, use of natural gas, those other jurisdictions are gonna to have to ramp up power quickly. The only way they're gonna be able to do that is with natural gas and coal. So there's not gonna be a net decrease in the use of fossil fuels because of this project. Yes, it may favor some fossil fuel companies over other fossil fuel companies, and therefore the ones who stand to lose from this are fighting it and they do make odd allies for us. But the reality is the use of fossil fuels is not gonna be decreased by this project. That's the problem with it. Jeff, did you want to weigh in? Yeah, just quickly. I, I also think the labeling of Next Terra as a fossil fuel company is, is a little bit odd because like all of the other companies, including Hydro-Quebec, including Iberdrola, uh, they produce a bunch of things and they own 22,000 megawatts of um, solar, wind, and landfill gas, which They're is about natural gas as they own. They're the largest generator of solar and wind power in the world and CMP calls them a fossil fuel company. And, and I don't say that to greenwash them, I just say that they're the same kind of actor that CMP is and they're in this for economic reasons, just like CMP and Hydro-Quebec are. I'm gonna pitch this next question over to uh, Nicole. This question comes from Michael Catania. Question is, will the third part of question one, 
require that two thirds of the legislature approve new lines coming across state riparian lands from offshore wind platforms. Can you just speak a little bit about um, what question one would uh, empower the legislature to do? Yeah, so the, the ballot question does have a few components. And so this component is saying that um, the legislature would need to approve certain types of transmission lines by two thirds vote. And the certain is very important. What it specifically is calling out is for-profit transmission lines that are not for reliability for Maine or the New England grid specifically. And secondly, they cannot be um, generator uh, lead lines, which are lines that connect a generator to the grid to then be distributed. Um, to the rest of the state and the region. So I, I think the PUC would be the ultimate arbiter whether or not those lines are generator lead lines. In my view, they would be uh, because they'd be going straight from the source of wind generation to where they would get dispersed to the grid. Unlike this merchant line, which is coming across uh, a whole other country and through our state to go to another place. Um, so they are very different types of lines. So um, the legislature would be approving only really specific types of transmission lines in the future. And again, it wouldn't be politicians deciding whether your lights would be on or off. Reliability uh, lines would not be included in that, in that approval process. Great. Uh, I'll pitch this next question over to you, Nick. Um, question, question comes from Neil. Uh, the question is, can you talk about the wording uh, in uh, question one in regards to retroactivity? Uh, maybe just talk a little bit about how um, you know Maine has a precedent of of enacting retroactive uh, laws. Um, so this isn't uh, anything new. Can you talk a little bit about that. Yeah, uh, the reason that this uh, referendum contains retroactive language is very simple. It's because CMP violated the Constitution of Maine in 2014 and again in 2020 when it negotiated illegal leases with the. Uh, Bureau of Parks and Lands. Um, the referendum was drafted before the court, uh, the Superior Court had ruled that those leases were illegal, um, but the court has since ruled on that. And this referendum is retroactive because it's designed to say those leases across public lands are illegal. It's very clear under the main constitution that if you are going to have a large project comparable to uh, the CMP corridor cross public lands that you must get a two thirds vote of the legislature. In spite of the fact that that's clear in the constitution, um, the, these leases were negotiated without consultation with the legislature and um, the court has found that illegal. And so all the referendum is doing is trying to uh, get, get across that um, any kind of project that crosses public lands that's of this scale needs to have a two thirds vote of the legislature. And it has retroactive language in it so that it covers that illegal lease that crossed public lands in 2014. And then the same uh, repeat of that illegal lease that crossed over public lands in 2020. Great, thank you. Nicole, would you like to add to that? You're and muted, you're Nicole. I realized right away, thank you. <laughs> I would like to add as a person who um, is under attack by this statement uh, through the work that I do for the main people at the legislature, we do already have the authority to create retroactive laws. And certainly if we didn't, we wouldn't have gotten a bunch of citizens to get together to circulate a petition about something else in order to create that ability. We would have just passed the law to do that. What we do at the ballot box is the same as passing a law. So I just hope that you'll see the absurdity of this accusation and dismiss it and tell your friends it's totally made up. The legislature already has this authority. We did it in the energy committee last year. CMP didn't say anything about it at that time because it's legal. Great, um, then pitch this next question over to you, Liz. Um, question is in regards to uh, the main biomass industry um, and how it could be affected by this transmission line. Um, question is, I was quite surprised to hear that the main biomass industry might be reduced by two thirds as a result of this corridor. What is the reason for this? Can you speak a little bit to that, Liz? Sure. Well, um, you know, the main 
our main energy grid um, is not is not uh, that large. And Maine is an exporter of energy. We make we produce more energy than we need. So um, all of the energy providers in our state have to tie into it in order to sell on the market. And um, when this Canadian Massachusetts power contract um, comes in, it will it will have a, it has a contract and it's uh, six cents per kilowatt hour, and um, it will flood the main power grid in such a way that the for example, main solar is only at 3.5 cents per kilowatt hour, and it just can't compete. It doesn't, it can't get all of our energy providers can't use our energy grid if this Canadian power is coming down here to Massachusetts. So what experts testified is that it could cut the biomass industry by two thirds and also close our natural gas plants because they wouldn't be able to tie into it and we wouldn't be able to compete. It would also make it harder for new renewable energy projects to tie into the main power grid if this Canadian power is filling it up. Does that answer it? Yep. Thank you. Thank you for that answer. Um, let's see, we have time for a couple more questions before we have to sign off for the evening. Again, if you have any questions for our panelists, please type them uh, in the Q&A box. Um, there's a question here um, about opposition in Massachusetts. Um, I'm not sure, maybe Liz, if you know uh, the answer to this one, have any climate justice allies in Massachusetts made a declaration of opposition to the CMP corridor? You know, are there folks in Massachusetts, you know, who are speaking out on, on this, uh, this project as well? Um, well, beyond the uh, Attorney General's uh, testimony, um, I I don't feel like I have that information. I'm not sure if Nick, you have it or? Uh, certainly Sierra Club uh, in Massachusetts uh, submitted a brief opposing this. Um, I think that there was not as much opposition in Massachusetts as we would have hoped. Um, it's not their forest and brook trout streams and livelihoods that are being destroyed. And I think that, um, has a, uh, that gives a, a very strong um, reason why uh, this has in, engendered so much more opposition uh, in Maine and New Hampshire than it has in Massachusetts. Great, I'm gonna, uh, oh, and Nicole, would you like to weigh in on this one? Yes, thank you. I just wanted to fact check myself, but and and Dan may have more information on this, but I remembered that the um, some leadership in the Wampanoag tribe in Massachusetts has stood with um, other tribal allies to oppose this and to try to bring attention to the Massachusetts legislature and governor about the atrocities um, being committed uh, by Hydro Quebec. Um, so that is another aspect. But I have family in Massachusetts. They think this is crazy. Uh, they've been to this area, man, they love it. They're like, why are we doing this <laughs> to you? So I think regular Massachusetts people stand with us too. Great. I'm going to pitch this next question over to you, Jeff. Um, question is, uh, given the fractitious nature of political parties today and that the main legislature has term limits that prevents the depth of understanding required to uh, understand complex environmental issues like this, why should we trust that the state legislature uh, to do the environmentally correct thing rather than the career staff at our environmental agencies? Um, can you answer that one, Jeff? Yeah, it, it, it's a great question, and, and I appreciate the question. And I will say I, I've certainly had my share of um, fractious partisan battles in the main legislature. I'm going to have to say, though, this issue has not been one of them. Um, you know, we've got we've got uh, very liberal Democrats and very conservative Republicans um, who are, have been our champions on this issue through a number of bills, some of which have passed the legislature and then been vetoed, some of which have passed the legislature but not quite gotten two thirds to go into, into um, uh, uh, law as an emergency. So I think the, the legislature has been great on this issue. I have also worked with BPL staff for my entire career. Uh, I have a lot of respect for many of the people there. Um, and I have been flabbergasted by how poorly and frankly, um, 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 dishonestly, they have taken up this issue. And so I, I really take offense to this. And I want to be very specific here. I was on the advisory committee 
that was asked to help write the management plan for the lands we're talking about this project crossing right now. The state owns multiple lands in there, including that called stream property, including the two public lots in question, including adjacent lands that the state has either bought or has owned for a long time. Uh, I started work on that committee in 2015 after the first 2014 lease had already been issued. Um, I was sitting on that committee when that lease got renegotiated. Um, and, and I don't believe they had finalized their report the second time it got renegotiated. And at no time did DPL staff in any way seek even the opinions of those of us on their advisory committee about what the impacts of this line were on our public lands. So although I trust them and they do fantastic work all over the state, I don't know if it's because of political pressure or, or, or what else it may be, but they have been terrible on this issue and you shouldn't trust them. If you think you should, please read Judge Murphy's opinion because it is scathing about their actions. Great, thanks so much. Um, and I think we're gonna end the questions there. We're, we're past the hour. Um, we really appreciate all of our panelists joining us this evening and everybody here for tuning in. Um, I'm going to drop here in the chat for everyone um, a link to NRCM's fact sheet on question one uh, and outlining uh, why we encourage Mainers to go to the polls on November 2nd and vote yes on question one um, So as some follow-up reading. Um, as I mentioned at the outset, uh, uh, you'll receive an email from me in the next couple of days with a link to watch the recording of this program. We hope that you'll share that with friends and family uh, to encourage them to go out and vote yes on question one on November 2nd, and also share that fact sheet that I just shared there. Um, so thanks very much for tuning in this evening. Thanks so much to our panel uh, for all of your hard work over the years uh, uh, against this corridor. We finally have our chance uh, to vote against this project on November 2nd. Uh, and um, thanks so much for, for all of your hard work. Uh, and thanks everyone for tuning in and enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>